So a lot of times we're using the system for conversions. So you need to know how those work together. We talked about that a little before. So like milli, we use a symbol. It's a small m for prefix. And mathematically, that's the same thing as saying 10 to the minus third. That's one one thousandth, right? So you could actually just write that the symbol milli, m, is equal to 10 to the negative third. If you wanted to, you could do it that way. And then once you've said the symbol and the number have an equivalence like this, you could say, now I'm going to apply it to something. Maybe I want to work with liters. So I could say, oh, well then I'll use these two symbols together and I'll say then that a milliliter is one thousandth of a liter. Although quite honestly, more often you will see somebody write a thousand milliliters is a liter. This is called an equivalent statement because there's an equal sign there. Whenever you have an equivalent statement, you can use it to create an appropriate conversion factor. Why do I say appropriate? Well, since these are equal, I can stack them up either way. I could say 1000 milliliters divided by a liter. Well, those are the same thing, right? So that just means it's a name for the number one. And anytime you multiply by one, you haven't changed anything. But we use this in a way that it does change things. The other way, of course, is I could put the liter on top and the thousand milliliters on the bottom. Once again, since a liter is exactly the same thing as a thousand milliliters, I've created a fraction that is really equal to one. And if I use it to multiply something else, nothing will change. And we see that I have a star here again. Here's the thing. You have internalized an awful lot of these. For instance, if I asked you, how many seconds are there in two minutes? You would just say, oh, there's 120 seconds in two minutes. You did that just on your own. You didn't even hardly have to think about it because you've internalized the equivalent statement. Which one am I talking about? The one that says one minute is equal to 60 seconds. You've internalized this equivalent statement. And when I said, how many seconds are there in two minutes? You immediately used a conversion factor. You did it all in your head. But what you did is you said, okay, I know there are 60 seconds in one minute. And then you got rid of the minutes. They're gone. There was one on the numerator and one in the denominator. You canceled them out. They're gone. Then you said two times 60. And you said, well, that's 120 seconds. And you just immediately told me what it is. I'm pointing all this out because you are going to learn a lot of new equivalent statements that you can turn into conversion factors, but they'll be new to you. So you won't be able to just spit it out like you would with this question. So now that you can look at one that you are very good at, you can think about how you would apply it in a case where you're not good at it. Let's talk a little bit about notation. Um, in our endeavors, we will use a lot of scientific notation instead of ordinary notation, but it does remind me of a joke that I like to tell. Mom has been taking care of the kids for weeks on end, and she has had it. She's like, I'm, I'm done. Dad, it's your turn. Go take them somewhere. I want the rest of the day for me time. All right. So dad's like, okay. Take the kids somewhere. Where am I going to take the kids? All right, I'm going to take them to the Natural History Museum. They can see like the the skeletons and the dinosaurs and stuff like that. That 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 that'll be good. I'll take them there. So he takes them to the Natural History Museum, and they they get into the front door, and there in the lobby is this huge T-Rex skeleton. Okay, and the kids are so excited because they know that that's really old, and they're like, "How old is it? How old is it?" How old is it, Daddy? And he's like, I don't know. Let's go look. There's probably a plaque at the front that will tell us how old the, the skeleton is. Well, I get up the front and it says the plaque's been removed uh, to be refinished because, you know, it's made out of brass and it's polishing or something, you know, and, and it's not there. And he's like, oh dear, okay. 
Uh, well, let me look for a docent. A docent would know the answer to this. And he looks around at the entire lobby. He doesn't see anybody who's a docent, but he does see a security guard. And he's like, well, he works here. I'll go ask him. He goes over to the security guard and he says, um, do you know how old this T-Rex skeleton is? And the security guard says, yes, absolutely, I do. It is 65 million and four years old. And dad's like, "What? wait, what? Wow, that's amazing that they could know the age so precisely. And he said, how did you find out about it? And the fellow said, well, when I came to work here four years ago, they told me it was 65 million years old. So this gets into why we worry about significant figures. You see, this poor security guard was told 65 million years old. When they told him 65 million, they probably meant that only these two were significant. Otherwise, they would have said 65.5 million years old, right? So these are the only two that are significant sig figs, significant figures. But he went ahead and added the four and came up with 65 million and four years old. But you see, that is in the noise as far as this measurement is concerned. This was a measurement. It had a certain number of significant figures and we're not really allowed to add that because it won't impact the number here. And that is a kind of an overview of the whole business of having different types of notation. We will use either ordinary notation or scientific notation depending on what it is we're working with. Scientific notation is excellent for really large and really small numbers because when you have to write down that many zeros, you might get lost. I mean, that's why we have commas, is to try to keep us from making mistakes when we're writing it in ordinary notation. But in scientific notation, you can make it exactly clear what are the significant digits. I can see from this that there are two sig figs. This front part before the multiplication sign, this front part is always going to let you be able to count the number of sig figs in a number. Here, we would not be sure how many sig figs there are because we don't know if that zero was significant or not. If we did have a situation where it was significant, when we wrote it as significant figures, we'd go ahead and say, hey, that first zero, yeah, you can trust it. We put it right here in the scientific notation. So that is a nice aspect of scientific notation that makes it useful and makes it easier to figure out how many sig figs you actually have. This brings us to another little aspect that you will use a lot and that is dimensional analysis. You're going to spend a lot of time working with what sort of units something is described by. So I had an interesting thing that happened to me when I um, was in Spain. I rented a car in Spain and you know, in the United States, your car will tell you how many miles per gallon you are getting. Well, needless to say, they do not use miles, nor do they use gallons in Spain. They use kilometers instead of miles, and they use liters instead of gallons. So I'm looking at the display in this car, and I'm like, I have no idea if I'm getting good mileage or not, because it's not in the units I'm used to. So I look at the, at the display in the car, and what the display in the car says is that I will need 6.4 liters of gasoline to go 100, and that's precisely 100, kilometers. And I look at that, and I'm like, okay, well, that is just wrong. <laughs> I mean, yes, scientifically, this is a wonderful number, but for me, I'm sorry, I'm used to figuring it, everything out in miles per gallon, so I'm going to have to change some stuff. I need to change liters into gallons. So I look in the back of the book and I find out the equivalent statement for gallons and liters, and then I'm going to change it into that one gallon. And when it's written as an equivalent statement, this is considered precise, absolutely one gallon. And then three turns out to be 3.785 liters. And I set this 
in this direction as a conversion factor because that way I would be able to cancel the liters. Okay, now I've got gallons, great. I also need to deal with the kilometers. I go and look that up and what I find out is that one mile is equal to 1.6093 kilometers. That'll let me cancel the kilometers. And when I get done, I will come up with a number. My calculator spits this out. And this is about the time that I realized I do not have miles per gallon. I have gallons per mile. Oh, well, what am I supposed to do with that? It's upside down, right? There's a button on your calculator that looks like this. You just hit it. Hit that button after you get that, it will flip it. See, it's flipped. The X is now on the bottom, right? So it will flip it so that it will be miles per gallon and then whatever number it flips up for you. Okay, so I did that. This reciprocal button, it turned it into 36.749 and those flipped miles per gallon. Now that's what I'm used to. Now I should go back and do one more thing because my original piece of data here has only two sig figs. This you see had four, this had five, but this guy, that's the limiting one. I can only use two sig figs. So I would end up rounding this. So I'll round it to 37 miles per gallon. MPG is how we always see that. That's okay. Okay, that's, that's a reasonable amount of mileage for a car. Now, what else can we say about sig figs? When you're multiplying sig figs, you keep everything till the end, then you analyze and see what's the least number and you round. What if you were adding or subtracting though? You see, sometimes you might end up with, say, here's a number that has three sig figs, but I have to subtract off another number that has three sig figs. After I do my subtraction, I only have two sig figs left. I don't get to add a zero on the end here. Okay, so when you subtract, you might end up with fewer sig figs than you started with from your original numbers. If you're adding, let's say you add 7.2 and you were supposed to add 8.4 to that. Both of these have two sig figs, but when you're done, you ended up with three sig figs. So when you're adding, you might end up getting more sig figs than the original number. When you're multiplying and dividing, you're just gonna pick the smallest one and that will be your number of sig figs. But when you're subtracting, you might lose them, you might not. And when you're adding, you might get more. Again, you might not. But that's what you need to know to try to keep you on track with significant figures because they can be a little